Hello, CST family, and happy April safety meeting. As most of you know by now, our wonderful safety and training manager, Regina Fronteras, has decided to relocate, so she's leaving us. So, in the interim, you're stuck with me <laughs> for another fun-filled safety meeting. This month, we're going to focus on safe turning practices, complacency, COVID-19 policy updates, the CST dress code policy and how it relates to safety, and some clarification on the child check double check process. Just a reminder, to receive credit for this meeting, you must complete the quiz and turn it into me for now. So, without further delay, let's jump right in to safe turning practices. Intersections. Wow, there's so much to discuss when it comes to intersections. Intersections involve the most risk you'll encounter as a professional driver. Around 40% of all collisions happen in or around intersections. Yes, 40%. It is that high. Even worse are the consequences. Intersection accidents are often severe, especially when a bus is involved. Now this program will show you how to use the tools of Triple LC Defensive Driving to enable you to remove or reduce the risk as you navigate all types of intersections. Isn't that right, JR? It sure is, Robbie, but it's also easy to forget about the risks. And it only takes one second of inattention to ruin your safe driving record, or worse, cause injury or death to another person. In this program, we'll discuss the different types of intersections you'll have to deal with and their specific risks. We'll teach you how to safely approach intersections and get through them without any problems so you never develop unsafe behavior patterns. A good way to learn how to prevent accidents is to look back and learn from the causes of past accidents. We asked some drivers what they know about intersection accidents. Now, as we ask these questions, think about what your answers would be before the drivers share theirs. JR, what's the first question? Okay. Question number one, what percent of intersection accidents happen on clear, dry days? I'd say about 50%. I'll bet it's pretty high, like 75%. This may surprise you, but 92% of intersection accidents happen on a clear day and only 8% happen in rain or snow. Wow, I did not expect that. Okay, question number two. What percent of accidents occur in left turns, crossing over, and right turns? Most happen in left turns, so I would say 60% left turns, 20% crossing over, and 20% right turns. I think it'd be 50% on left turns, 30% from crossing over, and 20% from right turns. Well, you're close on some, but 61% occur in left turns, 35% in crossing over, and only 4% in right turns. Interesting. Okay, question number three. What do you think are the main causes of intersection accidents? Going through red lights, speeding, and not paying attention. Rushing, being distracted, and not paying attention. Well, the DOT studies tell us that intersection accidents are caused by three groups of causes. These are, the first is recognition error, which leads to 64% of all intersection accidents. The driver failed to look or looked and did not see. That accounts for 44% of all intersection accidents. Had an obstructed view, 8%, internal distraction, 6%, and inattention, such as daydreaming, 6%. The second was decision errors led to 29% of all intersection accidents, 8% to a false assumption about others' actions, too fast for conditions or aggressive driving, 8%, illegal maneuvers, 7%, and misjudgment of gap or other speeds, 6%. Finally, performance errors led to 7% of all intersection accidents, with 4% from overcompensation or poor directional control, and only 3% from panic or freezing. Now that's a lot of facts and figures, but what do you think we can learn from this data if we want to prevent intersection accidents? There's a lot that can go wrong when driving a school bus or van through intersections, right? As a professional driver, we are held to a different standard than others on the road. 
We've been trained to watch for the mistakes of other drivers and to expect the unexpected. We want to always reduce risk. Um, if we analyze the data that was just presented, it tells me that between recognition errors and decision errors, we as drivers need to fight against the urge to get comfortable. Failing to look or looking but not seeing seems like another way of saying that the driver was complacent. And that's so easy for us to do, right? The same route, the same kids, same schools, same streets, same neighborhoods, same bus stops. It is so easy to get comfortable and to run through the motions. But as professional drivers, we simply cannot allow ourselves to let that happen. We are transporting the most precious cargo there is. And the people that we're sharing the road with are equally as valuable. Every day we pass someone's mom or dad, brother or sister, daughter or son, granddaughter, grandson, niece, nephew, grandpa, grandma. I mean, you get the point. Transporting kiddos to school is such an important job. We cannot forget that. As I think about all these causes, I can see how the four actions in Triple LC would eliminate almost every one of them. Look ahead, look around, leave room, and communicate. And not rushing would eliminate almost every accident. Most accidents happen on clear, dry days when the vehicle is turning left and the main cause is the driver did not look or looked and did not see. We need to really pay more attention when turning left. If we go back to the basics, our goal is to remove or reduce risk. And yes, we can use the tools of the Triple LC Defensive Driving Course to help reduce the risk as you safely navigate through intersections. Think back to your own experiences in and around intersections, or think of some of the news articles you've seen or read about intersection accidents. As a group, discuss each of the causes of intersection accidents and how Triple LC would reduce the risk from these causes. Prevention starts with a good pre-trip inspection. Make sure that you are completely and thoroughly checking your bus and its mechanics as directed by the DVIR. Do not just go through the motions and definitely do not fill out your DVIRs in advance. That's strictly prohibited and could lead to disciplinary action. Things you want to check for include your mirrors and the mountings and positioning of them. And do a thorough and complete light check to include your taillights, brake lights, and turn signals. Some of the buses are equipped with a bulb check switch that's next to your headlight switch. While this is great to make sure that you don't have any burnt out light bulbs, this is not an effective way to check your turn signals, four-way hazards, eight-way yellows, and eight-way reds. Make sure when you are completing your pre-chip that you are checking those systems by activating them and using the actual switches and buttons. This is just a short list of things that you need to check during your pre-trip. For extra credit, can you correctly list the sequence to check your air brakes? And for our monitors, what items should be included on every lift equipped sped bus? So besides a good pre-trip, the triple LC is really the most effective and valuable way to prevent honestly any accident, including intersection accidents. Here are some of the accidents that I could think of that Triple LC helps to prevent. So for the look ahead principle, you can use this to help see, see the vehicles that are potentially speeding up to beat the light and run through it when it turns red. Uh, it also helps to watch for pedestrians who might be considering crossing against the light or bicyclists who aren't adhering to the traffic laws. The look around principle helps us to change our focus every five to eight seconds and will definitely be useful to spot pedestrians potentially entering one of our blind spots or vehicles that are trying to squeeze in between our bus and the curb while we're turning. The leave room principle helps if our fellow drivers suddenly decide to change lanes in the middle of the intersection or maybe even just simply stop for what seems like no reason. <laughs> and the communicate principle can help vehicles who could be too close to our bumpers know when we are planning to turn or slow down. What other potential risks can be prevented using the triple LC principles that you can think of? Here's just a few of the things that can go wrong at an intersection. You could be T-boned on either side by a vehicle traveling on the intersecting street. 
You could collide with a car trying to squeeze between you and the curb. You could hit a parked car or stationary object while you're making a turn. You could have a head-on collision when trying to turn left or when you're going straight through the intersection and someone turns left in front of you. You could hit a pedestrian or cyclist. And you could rear-end a vehicle that stops suddenly in front of you. So, a lot of things can go wrong in intersections. All intersections are dangerous. In fact, they're the most dangerous driving environment you'll face. Vehicles, pedestrians, and cyclists are all coming and going in and out of the intersection from different directions. One of the most important practices at intersections is that you remain in control at an appropriate speed. No rushing. Rushing leads to accidents. Get in the appropriate lane as soon as you can and stay in control. Slow down. And as you know, two things, such as cars and buses, just can't be in the same place at the same time. When they are, we have a collision. There are two main categories of intersections, controlled and uncontrolled. When you're out on the road, almost all of the intersections you'll encounter are controlled, meaning the right of way is determined by traffic signals or traffic signs. But you'll also have to deal with uncontrolled intersections. These are common in rural areas, private property, and parking lots, where vehicles come together and have to cross paths without any indication as to who gets to go first. Let's start with controlled intersections. They can be four-way, two-way, and one-way stops that are controlled or regulated by signs or flashing lights. Controlled intersections have specific laws regarding who gets to go first. In dense urban and suburban settings, most controlled intersections have traffic lights. It's important to remember that other drivers may or may not follow the rules. As a trained professional, you have to watch out for the other guy, even when you have the right of way. Knowing what the other guy is going to do enables you to remove or reduce the risk. The easiest controlled intersection to understand is a stop sign or a red flashing light where the cross street has the right of way and you don't. Pull up to the stop line and come to a complete stop. Look left, then right, then left again, and do not rush. As you look around, you will see any vehicles coming and allow for them before you enter the intersection. Use your defensive driving techniques. Look ahead and look around. In this case, look in each direction of the intersecting road as far as you can to make sure the intersection will remain clear until you can safely get through it. Keep your head and eyes moving so you know all the factors going on around you. If your mind says, I think I can make it, don't even try. Only go when you know you can make it. Keep in mind the length of your vehicle and the time it takes to safely get through the intersection. If two vehicles arrive at a two-way stop in opposing directions, the vehicle turning left should yield to the approaching traffic going straight or turning right. Other motorists may not be aware of this. At my last district, we had a number of pedestrian fatalities while making left-hand turns. In every case, the driver said they never saw the pedestrian. They just felt the bump as they hit them. Sometimes, the pedestrian can be hidden by the cone of blindness created by the roof pillar and the mirrors. As you approach the intersection, observe any pedestrians around or approaching and continuously monitor them before moving. Remember, if you rock and roll before and during the turn, you will always see the pedestrians. This is a great time to use another defensive driving technique. Communicate. Signal early and slow down gradually as you approach the intersection. Make sure the other driver sees you and knows what you want to do next. Always use your signals and, if you need to get their attention, give them a friendly tap of the horn. Remember, 8% of intersection accidents are from falsely assuming other drivers' intentions. Communicating will prevent this. Now, at four-way stops, everyone has to come to a complete stop before proceeding. The vehicle that arrives first goes first. But if two vehicles arrive at the same time at a four-way stop, the vehicle on the left must yield the right of way to the vehicle on their right. But here's the problem. Other drivers don't always follow the rules. <laughs> You're kidding, right? <laughs> I know it's hard to believe, but it's true. There are millions of drivers out there, but the vast majority are amateurs. They're not paid professionals, and they don't have advanced training. As the professional, you must be better at defensive driving, and that means being ready for the other drivers to make mistakes. Learn to allow for their mistakes. If it looks like they might go out of turn, let them. That's right. 
Better to be safe than sorry. Now let's go back and cover the second type of intersections, uncontrolled intersections. That means there aren't any signals or signs to indicate who has the right of way. Out on the road, uncontrolled intersections are rare, but they're common in congested places like parking lots and busy commercial areas. Even though traffic is moving slowly, uncontrolled intersections can be dangerous. There are thousands of accidents every year in parking lots at the uncontrolled intersection of the lanes. These are very common. What should I do when I have to go through an uncontrolled intersection? When two vehicles arrive at an uncontrolled intersection, the vehicle on the left should yield to the vehicle on its right. However, as the professional, you can't take it for granted that the other driver will know this and yield the right of way to you, even when it's legally yours. Never, ever assume the other driver will slow down or stop. Cover your brake and be prepared to stop. Once again, communication is vital. Know what the other driver is going to do and make sure they understand your intentions. Don't forget to signal early. Once the intersection is clear, look left, look right, look straight, then look left again. And only then should you proceed with caution. And don't forget to rock and roll. So let's take a little vocabulary test. Who can tell me what a jug handle turn is? While you consider that, let me throw another term at you. A button hook turn. One is an acceptable maneuver and one is not. If you said that the jug handle turn is the acceptable maneuver, you would be wrong. <laughs> the reason the jug handle turn is dangerous is because you move like you're turning left only to then swing right. The initial move to the left can be interpreted as your intention to turn left or to move into the left lane and another motorist may try to squeeze by and pass you or to turn. Which brings me to my next vocabulary term, squeeze play. When other drivers do this, it is called squeeze play. We'll come back to squeeze play in just a sec. As you can see from this handy dandy diagram, the button hook turn is the safer turning maneuver. Just remember to clearly communicate to your fellow drivers your intentions well in advance and make sure it's clear because you must cross into oncoming traffic for a short distance. Real quick, before we move on, can you tell me What's the speed limit for left-hand turns? If your answer was five to 10 miles per hour, you're right. Okay, let's turn to another subject, turns. Seriously. <laughs> After all, you won't always be going straight through every intersection. But there's a lot to learn about turns, and the best place to learn is when you're sitting in the driver's seat. That's right, Robbie, but let's touch on a few important points. The first thing to keep in mind is to communicate your intentions to others. As we said, always signal early, at least five flashes of the indicator. Look around and watch for other vehicles, pedestrians, and cyclists, and be sure to check your mirrors every five to seven seconds. When making a right turn, position your bus three feet from the curb or parked cars to block the area on your right and prevent someone from squeezing into your blind spot. When it's safe and clear to go, Pull forward and use your reference point to determine when to begin the turn. Always use the push-pull steering method. It gives you greater control and keeps you from going too fast. Check your mirrors before and during the turn and use the rock and roll procedure to eliminate any blind spots and avoid collisions with pedestrians. Also, cross-check your mirrors for tail swing throughout your turn. Now, making left turns is a bit different, but many of the same principles apply. Be sure to communicate to others by using your signals. Position yourself in the center of the turning lane. Pull forward only when it's safe to do so and use your reference points to begin the turn. Always use the push-pull steering method to maintain control and a safe speed and then rock and roll to watch out for pedestrians. There are two other challenges that come from turns, tail swing and off tracking. I'll start with tail swing. Tail swing happens every time you turn the bus. As the front end of your bus goes in one direction, the rear end goes the opposite direction. If you're not careful, tail swing can lead to accidents. Well, if you're telling me tail swing always happens, how am I supposed to avoid having accidents? Always position yourself in the center of the turn lane. Tail swing extends the rearmost corner of your bus outward by two to three feet during the turn. If you're centered in the lane, you'll be all right. 
If you're making a left turn and there are two left turn lanes, position yourself in the center of the far right turn lane. Check the left and right mirrors before you make the turn. And check the left mirror again before moving and monitor during the turn. Make the turn slowly and smoothly, no more than three to five miles per hour. That gives you and everyone around you time to react if necessary. And last but not least, we have off tracking. A bus is very long and the rear wheels don't exactly follow the front wheels. The arc they form during a turn is more shallow. When making a turn, you have to allow for the off tracking or it could result in an accident. You do this by using your reference points. You'll learn them during your behind the wheel training. Following your reference points sets the bus up to turn without cutting off the inside corner with your rear wheels. Intersections are very high hazard areas. Turns, tail swing, and off tracking are just a few of the risks you'll face, but you'll master each one of them on your journey to becoming a professional operator. Next, we'll cover a few real life case studies about intersection accidents and discuss how they could have been prevented. So let's talk a little bit about what happens to the tires and the wheels of the bus during a turn. The term called off tracking refers to the path that the front set of tires takes versus the back. The back tires have a smaller turn radius than the front tires. This tighter turn for the back set of tires is why squeeze play is so dangerous and has to be avoided. Let's look at a real world example of how off tracking can really be hazardous. A bus operator pulls up to an intersection to make a right turn. Meanwhile, a motorcycle slips in alongside the bus to the right. They both begin the turn at the same time, and the off-tracking of the bus crushes the motorcyclist into a light pole. How could this accident have been prevented? In this scenario, a couple of things could have helped to prevent this accident. Number one, using the triple LC and the look around and communicate. It would have helped to prevent this from happening. Look around includes looking in your mirrors every five to eight seconds, and the motorcyclist would have been seen in your mirror. Communicate could also have possibly prevented this accident by using your turn signal. The motorcyclist would have seen the turn signal and hopefully understood that your intention was to turn. Another thing that would have helped to prevent this from happening would be using your reference points and keeping your rear tires no more than three feet from the curb. Another thing would be to avoid the jug handle turn and use the button hook turn so that there's no confusion about which direction you intend to go in. Can you think of anything else that would help prevent this accident? Let's look at another real life example. A bus operator approaches an intersection that he's been through a thousand times before. The light's green, he speeds up to get through, when suddenly he's surprised as it turns yellow and then red before he gets there. Just as he enters the intersection against a red light, a sports car comes flying through at a high rate of speed and he T-bones them. How could this accident have been prevented? I think in this scenario, the driver was most likely suffering from complacency. This intersection is one that he drives through every day, probably multiple times a day for weeks and months. The driver may even feel like they know how the light operates, the way the cycles run, the timing of the light, all that stuff. You probably have several intersections on your route that you drive through several times a day and have those same kinds of thoughts. The problem with thinking that you know how the light will operate is acutely expressed in this example. Complacency leads to accidents. You need to treat each intersection like you would an unknown area. Fight the urge to think you know how it will operate. Keep your brake covered, approach with caution, rock and roll to see around your blind spots, and always be prepared to stop. We'll talk more about complacency later in this month's training, but for now, with this example, the way this accident could have been prevented was, number one, the driver should have had the brake covered and been prepared to stop, and two, treated the intersection like it was the first time he was maneuvering through it. The example also talks about how the light was green. Our training teaches us to treat stale green lights like yellow and red lights. This means be prepared to stop and approach with extreme caution, staying alert by looking ahead and looking around. A bus operator is running a bit late when he pulls up to a red light and gets ready to make a left turn at a busy intersection. 
While he's waiting for the light to turn, he scans the area and sees that everything is clear. As soon as the light turns green, he accelerates into his turn. When he's almost all the way through the intersection, he hears a thump. He stops the bus and gets out to look, finding a pedestrian badly injured and lying on the ground near his front left wheel. Later, he claims with great sincerity and believability that he never saw them. How could this accident have been prevented? This is a tragic scenario that is caused by a blind spot. Rocking and rolling in your seat through your turns at intersections is the best way to prevent this from ever happening. Something else to consider is your environment when you're sitting at a red light waiting for it to turn. The pedestrian was visible then. Remember the look ahead and look around principles of the LLC. Being aware of the possible risks will help you make the right decisions. So, for left turns, here's a couple of tips to keep in mind when approaching an intersection. Number one, as you approach, prepare to maneuver into the proper lane well in advance of the turn. Last minute lane changes are too risky and not worth it. Remember, you're paid by the hour, so rerouting so you can safely move into the correct lane is always your best option. Number two, make sure you have enough time to get your entire 40-foot vehicle through the entire intersection before entering. We want to be courteous drivers in our community as well as risk-reducing drivers. <laughs> the next tip is to make sure to keep your vehicle to the right side of your lane during a turn so you do not roll up on the curb or leave any room for someone to squeeze in. Finally, watch your rear end. Keep your tail swing in mind. We don't want to hit anything or anyone with our back end. Because you know I'm all about that bass, about that bass. Next, make sure that you signal your intention to turn at least five clicks away from the intersection. When you've reached the center of the intersection, that's when you start your turn, making sure to stay within the five to 10 mile per hour speed limit for left turns. If there's two turning lanes, always use the right-hand turning lane unless there's signage to indicate to do something else. I have the perfect example to show you when there's two turning lanes. On 10 Mile Road, when traveling southbound towards CUNA between Franklin and Overland, when you are at that intersection to get onto I-84 eastbound towards Boise, there is a sign for trucks to use the inside left turning lane. In this instance, you would follow the signs and use the left side lane for that left turn. As with many things in life, this intersection is an exception to the rule. But always remember, if there isn't a sign, make sure you use the right-hand lane for left turns. For right-hand turns, here are some safety tips to be mindful of when approaching an intersection. Number one, Make sure to maneuver into the proper lane well in advance using the proper turn signals. Number two, while you're in the process of turning, make sure to keep the rear of your bus to the right. You don't want to leave any room for someone to squeeze play the bus. Number three, if the intersection is really tight, make sure to use the button hook turn. Never use the jug handle turn. Using the button hook turning maneuver will also keep your rear tires from rubbing or riding up on the curb. Clearly communicate with your fellow drivers what your intentions are and when in doubt, wait or reroute. Also, make sure to take your turn slowly. The speed limit for right hand turns is three to five miles per hour. Another great tip to help avoid intersection accidents is to plan your route. Our amazing routers do a fantastic job creating safe and efficient routes, but they cannot see every intersection or predict future complications like construction and road closures. Maybe someday IDT will create a notification system that will give us real-time updates on the roads. But while we wait for that to happen, <laughs> if you see a potential hazard or unsafe anything, speak to your router. We are all dedicated to transporting these littles to the schools and activities as safely as humanly possible. But the only way to get a problem fixed 
is for you to say something about it. So let us know. Intersections are very dangerous. In fact, they're the most dangerous driving environment you'll ever face. Never assume that you're clear to cross an intersection. Always look around before you proceed and only when you're sure it's safe. Remember, 92% of intersection accidents happen on a clear, dry day, and 61% are from left-hand turns. Most of these are due to the driver failing to look or failing to see the other vehicle. Pay attention, rock and roll, and use triple LC. If in doubt, don't attempt the turn. Often, other drivers take sudden actions at intersections, like hard braking, as they realize at the last second they want to turn. Stay back and leave room so you don't get caught out in the intersection. There are two types of intersections, controlled and uncontrolled. As the professional, you can't take for granted that another driver will yield the right of way to you, even when it's legally yours. Never ever assume the other driver will slow down or stop. Communicate by making eye contact and tap your horn when necessary. Make sure everyone knows your intentions and you understand theirs. As you approach an intersection, slow down gradually and be sure to look ahead and look around. Get in the correct lane early and cover your brake. Be prepared to stop if you cannot cross safely. Don't rush into intersections. Rushing leads to accidents. And always leave room around every side of your bus. That little extra bit of room gives you the time needed to react to the unexpected and avoid a collision. And yes, we're going to say it again, the goal is to remove or reduce risk. You do this by avoiding all unsafe behaviors. Exactly. Do it right, the first time, every time. You can achieve this at intersections by using the tools of Triple LC. By not rushing. And by using the rock and roll technique to improve visibility. That was some great information about intersections. I hope you took something away from it. Next up is the COVID-19 policy update from RD. The year of COVID has given us all permanent heartburn, which by the way is not a symptom of COVID-19, but is certainly a byproduct. As vaccinations continue to roll out and our positive cases tend to decline, policies are beginning to change. People who have been tested positive for COVID-19 within the past three months and recovered do not have to quarantine or get tested again as long as they do not develop new symptoms. People who develop symptoms again within three months of their first bout of COVID-19 may need to be tested again if there is no cause identified for their symptoms. Now, people who have been in close contact with someone who has COVID-19, again, are not required to quarantine if they have been fully vaccinated against the disease and show no symptoms. Now the question is asked, what if I'm showing symptoms again and I've been fully vaccinated? Can I return to work? Well, there is no quarantine required, but to return to work, you must be symptom free and 90% improved. Now, if you ran a fever, you must be fever free and not taking any medications to reduce that fever. For everyone else who is not fully vaccinated, the same CDC guidelines apply. Remember, symptoms may appear two to 14 days after exposure to the virus. People with these symptoms may have COVID-19. Those symptoms include fever and chills, cough, shortness of breath or difficulty breathing, fatigue, muscle or body aches, headaches, new loss of taste or smell, sore throat, congestion or runny nose, nausea or vomiting or diarrhea. These are all signs of COVID-19. Look for emergency warning signs for COVID-19. If someone is showing any of these signs, seek emergency medical care immediately. Trouble breathing persistent pain or chest pressure, new confusion, inability to wake or stay awake, pale, gray, or blue colored skin, lips, or nail beds, depending on your skin tone. 
If you have not been vaccinated, but have been exposed to someone for more than 15 minutes who has tested positive for COVID-19, the stay at home request is still there. You should stay at home for 14 days after the last contact with that person. Watch for a fever, a cough, shortness of breath, or the other symptoms that we mentioned. If possible, stay away from others, especially people who are at high risk for getting very sick from COVID-19. Here are some of the newest guidelines to reduce your quarantine time based on your exposure to COVID-19. If you have been exposed, but choose not to be tested, after 10 days, you may return to work. If you've had a positive test result, again, after 10 days, you can return to work. Now, if you have been seven days since you were exposed and you take a test to find out if you have COVID-19 or not and the result is negative, you can return to work after seven days. These are the newest guidelines that we will follow here at Cascade. Masks are still required. That means that when you're on this property, you must be wearing one. When you're on the bus, you must be wearing one. So until next time, this is RD, your captain, talking about COVID and a subject I hope I don't have to talk about again. Thank you for listening. I'm sure we're in for a lot more changes when it comes to COVID, but for now, that's the update. Thank you, RD. Up next is Complacency with Terry Woods. The Complacency Trap. Human beings are designed to become complacent. It's in the way we think. Our mind mechanics create four key behaviors that are designed to make life go like clockwork. Yet, in their nature, they create sometimes unsafe behaviors. And throughout your toolbox talks, you will have discussed four key triggers that create unsafe behaviors. They are alpha, that place you go when you're daydreaming, mind and body in two different places. Habits, something you do every day. Time versus risk choices, human beings are time-saving machines. And finally, personal risk perception. The fact that human beings don't see themselves having accidents, and actually, that's a really good thing. Those four triggers all interact at the same time to create what we perceive to be unsafe behaviors and often lead us to unacceptable personal experiences or worse. So right in the middle of our complacency trap is personal risk perception. Personal risk perception means we all have Superman pants. We don't see ourselves having accidents. It allows us to do the daftest things, like come to work and drive every day without thinking something bad might happen. Now, personal risk perception then allows us to make simple little choices. You know the kind of choices, just to save a little time, take a little shortcut. And that leads us to the next trigger, time or effort versus risk. Because once we've taken that time or effort versus risk choice and taken the shortcut, if we repeat that choice for, let's say, 21 days, it soon becomes a habit. Now, habits, we said, are everything you do every day. And 99.7% of human behaviours are all habitual. We don't even remember or think about doing them. They happen as if by magic without thinking. Now, once it's become a habit, we soon learn we can do it without thinking. And because we can now do that task without thinking, we can drift off into alpha, where our mind and body are in two different places. Now, because our risk awareness changes when we drift off into alpha, this means we're now doing the task and not necessarily even aware of the risk that we're taking. So complacency is a human condition. We are literally designed through the way the mind works 
to become complacent to almost every task we do. And don't get me wrong, I'm not suggesting that every habit and every task we do has a built-in shortcut, something that's going to catch us out. But what happens is we get in a way of thinking and one by one by one, we walk ourselves into a trap we haven't seen coming. It's like our triggers take us gently down a small and slow spinning spiral. And this is our challenge. It's not that every behavior we do is unsafe. It's when the behaviors line up like dominoes in a row. Where our first shortcut that we took many years ago has become a habit. And we add a second shortcut that becomes a habit. And then because we don't see people getting hurt in the workplace, we get to a point where we actually think bad stuff just doesn't happen here. And that adds more weight to the existing shortcuts. And before you know it, you have lots of dominoes that all line up in a row. They're little choices that got made that lead us to the final one falling over and knocking somebody down. Here's the interesting thing. It isn't that they were all wrong. Some of them were probably good. But when you add them all together, when you look back and do an investigation, work out why somebody got hurt, I promise you this, you'll always find numerous opportunities where a simple challenge or a friendly reminder could have taken one of the choices, one of the dominoes out. And by taking one of the dominoes out, we would never have experienced the negative consequence of that accident. And this is our challenge. It's not that human beings are inherently safe. It's that human beings are the answer to our problems. They're the people that see their natural behaviors. They're the people that can remind each other to stay safe. We just have to help people understand why they do the daft things they do and encourage them to remind each other and report it when they find things that they do are unsafe. The complacency trap has helped us understand that human beings are designed to become complacent. It's in our wiring. And by understanding this and sharing it with our teammates, we can help every single person in the business make better choices and remind each other to stay safe. How does the complacency trap affect us as school bus drivers? With each passing day and school year as we gain experience, we start to make personal risk perceptions. We have on our Superman pants and we don't see ourselves as having accidents. We begin to make choices that are sometimes perceived as shortcuts or time savers. Things like skipping parts of a brake check, following too close, or not rocking and rolling at intersections. When those shortcuts don't immediately lead to an accident, we begin to repeat the behavior, thus creating a habit. Soon, we enter the alpha state, taking shortcuts without even realizing it and not being fully aware of the fact that we are engaging in a risky behavior. I challenge every person watching this to remember back to your first day of training. Remember when we talked about risk being the enemy and removing and reducing risky behaviors? Examine your own personal driving behaviors. Work to eliminate the risky behaviors and replace them with positive behaviors. If you need help identifying or changing your behaviors, or you're not sure of your skills or reference points, please come speak with a behind the wheel trainer. We will gladly take the time to help you improve your skills or change any unsafe behaviors. Don't let your competency become complacency. Remain the excellent driver that you were trained to be. When a fellow driver or employee talks to you about your risky behaviors, don't get angry or upset. Change those behaviors. A few minutes of a slightly embarrassing conversation may save you from years of pain and self-regret from causing a preventable accident. 
Great information, Terry. Thank you. Up next, we're going to be talking with Val Bettine on the dress code policy. Take it away, Val. Hello, CST family, and thank you for watching this training video. In this segment, we are going to discuss the dress code policy and how it relates to our culture of safety here at CST. First, the dress code states that all employees are expected to be neat, well-groomed, and practice good personal hygiene. Employees are to wear clean, casual clothing. Revealing clothing such as tank tops and low-cut shirts are not permitted. Shorts, skirts, and dresses must be mid-thigh to knee-high. Policies regarding tattoos, facial piercing, and clothing will follow the individual school district policy. References to drugs and alcohol, tobacco, and sexual or profane sayings or inappropriate pictures on clothing are prohibited. Footwear must completely enclose the foot and have a rubber sole or non-skid sole with a heel not to exceed one inch. Footwear cannot hinder the driver's or monitor's response time or their ability to perform their required duties. Inappropriate dress will result in a directive to return home a recorded absence and loss of pay for that segment. Employees must also wear a photo ID badge while on school grounds and on the school bus. So that, now that I've bored you uh, to tears regarding policies to, as they are written, let's talk a little bit about what it looks like at this location of Cascade Student Transportation. Here are examples of appropriate warm weather shirts and tops. As you can see, sleeveless shirts are hemmed and not cut off. The top portion of the shirt is at least three inches wide and meets the standards of neat, well-groomed, clean, and casual. This is a sample of shirts and tops that are not appropriate to wear to work. Crop tops, spaghetti straps, cut off sleeves and tank tops that do not have at least three inches of width at the shoulder are not permissible. Here are some examples of appropriate warm weather pants and shorts. Again, all of these examples show the edges are hemmed, the length of the shorts is no more than three inches from the top of the knee, and meets the standards mentioned in the policy of neat, well-groomed, clean and casual. Here are some examples of pants and shorts that are not appropriate to wear to work. This includes cut off shorts, leggings, and any pants or shorts with holes or tears. Regarding shoes, these are some examples of appropriate warm weather shoes. It is very important to protect your feet especially when dealing with any kind of heavy or commercial equipment. OSHA requires protective footwear be worn by any employee who is exposed to hazards involving commercial vehicles, rolling objects such as tires, objects that could pierce the sole, or if the employee could be exposed to a potential electrical hazard. So basically, protective footwear is essential to ensure safe, healthy feet while on the job. Here are examples of shoes for warm weather wear that are not appropriate at our bus lot or on the bus. This includes anything with an open toe, open heel, or with a high heel. We want you to be comfortable and cool, but safety has to take priority over comfort when it comes to working around commercial equipment, toxic chemicals, and hazardous conditions. So here's a list of why we require closed-toed, closed-heeled shoes. Number one, they protect your feet from accidents on the job. A good example would be when you're stepping onto the bus. If you don't lift your foot high enough on the step, you could trip or jam your foot onto the steel frame of the bus or on the steps. 
Another example is the clumsy but not uncommon stepping onto the curb and landing wrong. Or how about avoid getting a goat head thorn in your uh, shoe? Boy, that hurts. Or burning your skin from a hot piece of equipment or hot asphalt. Number two. The next reason is to protect your feet from spills. This could be any type of fluid from diesel fuel to vomit. <coughs> oh, excuse me. Number three. Another reason is to keep your feet healthy. There are a lot of different chemicals and toxins on the lot, and spills happen. Spills from oil, antifreeze, transmission fluid, lots of fluids with lots of chemicals and toxins. When a spill occurs, we do our best to clean it up, but it's inevitable that those chemicals and toxins mix with the topsoil on the ground. Open-toed, open-heeled shoes cannot block out that dust and dirt. And if you were to get a reaction from that exposure, it could lead to missed time at work. Number four, the uneven surfaces on the lot is another reason why we need to protect our feet. We are all too familiar with the broken asphalt out there, the loose gravel and exposed rocks that are throughout the entire lot. Appropriate footwear will help to reduce and the chances of an injury on the job. Please make sure to come to work dressed safely and appropriately. If you are approached by a trainer or a staff member about your attire, please know that we're not asking you to change for any other reason except we want you to be safe and represent our company and district professionally and appropriately. As the warm weather approaches, stay comfortable, stay cool, but most importantly, stay safe. Because after all, being safe is what we are all about. Great information, Val, thanks. Up next is the Child Check Double Check with Terry Marinos. Take it away, Terry. Hi there, my name is Terry Marinos and I'm one of the trainers here at Cascade Student Transportation. I want to take a few minutes today and talk about child check, double check process. Just to give a quick review, this is a map of our bus lot with the child check, double check stations. We have committed to our school district and our community to ensure no child is ever left on the bus in our lot. You're required to perform a child check after every segment of your route. But we've added another level of security by creating the double check policy. This means we perform a double check at the lot after every route, a.m., midday, and p.m. So when you come into the lot, a double check is required for every bus. Sometimes I don't think a lot of people are aware are the big orange cones at the entrance of every lane. If you ever wondered what those are there for, I'll be happy to help you. As a matter of fact, I needed help finding out what they were for. First and most important, there we go, they are there to remind us that to use extra caution. It also means there is a child check attendant at the end of each aisle. If the cone is not out, that means there is not a child checker attendant at the end of your aisle. You're going to need to circle back around to the front of the building, which is section or station six. Radio dispatch and let them know that you're in need of a child check. Double check. Another point I wanted to discuss is the traffic lane along the south lane. That's the lane that we exit out the west gate. Management has decided to allow personal vehicles to use this lane to exit using the west gate. Please know that the south lane is a two-lane road. In other words, traffic travels in both directions. So please do not pass. This is where we need to use our patience as we do out when we're driving all the children. We seem We've seen personal vehicles passing personal vehicles, personal vehicles passing buses, buses passing buses. Oh my. Just remember, we are in the business of safety first, then transportation. Make sure all your choices and behavior reflect this standard. Finally, I want to invite everyone who is available to join Cascade Student Transportation Paid Exercise Program. What? 
I mean the child check, double check group, seriously. If you're looking for a way to get your steps in and get paid to do it, oh my, this is always a good thing. This is the place to be. We have child check, double checks from 9 a.m. to 9.45, 11.30 to 1 p.m., 4.45 to 5.30 p.m., Tuesday through Friday. Monday's schedule is a bit different, as we all know. So on Mondays, we have child check from 10.30 a.m. to 12 p.m. and 2.30 p.m. to 3.45 p.m. It's a great way to earn extra cash and increase your step count. If you're interested, see any of the management and they will be happy to get you involved. I know this year has been a cluster of changes and I'm sure we are in for, four, for more changes still. Regardless of what is to come, let's all remember our commitment to safety and to our community. It really is a pleasure working with all of you. I enjoy what I do. If I can ever answer any questions, please ask. If I don't know what the answer is, I usually know where to get the answer or to find out. Thanks again for all you do. I'll see you around the lot. Hello, team. First of all, thank you for attending the safety meeting. Thank you for all that you do every day to help us be a success here at CST. And a special thank you for those of you that have taken the time to help us with child check. It's through your faithfulness that we have been able to make it a success. I want to take just a minute to hit on some quick points. Number one, safety is freedom from risk, and we all want to be free from risk. Number two, safety is always priority. We want being safe to be our number one goal. Also, everybody is responsible for safety. We are all responsible for making the safe choice all the time. Watch your speed. We are. Rock and roll around every corner. Every time you do a maneuver, make sure that you're clear. Keep your eyes moving and check your mirrors. Make sure you're clear before you change lanes, as you go around corners, checking your tail swing, and also, most importantly, make sure your mirrors are properly adjusted. And also, most important, search your bus for sleeping children every time it empties. And last of all, remember, you make the difference. Your actions, your commitment, your drive, and your faithfulness make the huge difference in our ability to be successful here at CST and in the lives of your children. Thank you so much. Remember that, and you are appreciated. Well, that wraps up April Safety Meeting. Thank you so much for attending. Don't forget to turn in your quiz. And as always, please stay safe.